Hi, I'm Joyce Foyer. And I'm David Foyer. In previous years, we have had the honor of welcoming you as you enter Rutfeit Sedek for High Holiday Services. But this year, we are not going to ask you for tickets right now. We are doing things a bit differently. We are welcoming you from our home, and we are delighted to be joining our Rutfeit Sedek family in this virtual setting. We hope that you and your families will have a meaningful and peaceful holiday. We wish all of you, from our family to yours, a very happy and healthy new year. L'Shana Tova. Thank you, Joyce and David. Shana Tova, everybody. I hope you had a good dinner and are comfortable in your seats and ready for what will be, just like Rosh Hashanah, a very meaningful Yom Kippur. We're about to begin with Kol Nidre, and we think of Kol Nidre as this grand prayer, which it is, yet it's a service that takes up all of two pages in our Moxor. Once Rachel, Jonathan, and uh, the choir are finished with the actual Kol Nidre prayer, we're going to begin Mariv, the evening service, and we'll have left the world of Kol Nidre. Um, but that's only under in normal times, not this year. So I want you to, to really take hold of Kol Nidre and what it is telling us about ourselves, what the liturgy is hinting at. And we heard a little bit about that for, um, from Hal Weitzman on Rosh Hashanah, that the prayer, when you look at it, is kind of the, the fast-talking legalese at the end of a pharmaceutical commercial. But just as he compelled us to think about that that is getting us to the point we need to be, that we're getting all this other stuff out of the way. We're going to form uh, a Beit Din, a legal court. We're going to take the Torahs out. We're going to surround ourselves with judges. But unlike in a regular court case, unlike the metaphoric court case that we talk about on Rosh Hashanah, we are each other's judges, and we need to hold each other accountable each other accountable for our actions and for the words that we're going to say, that they're not hollow but are real. In a moment, we're going to have a few meditations from your fellow community members on what the, the prayer is pushing them towards thinking about, but we're also going to spread those out throughout the service tonight. You're going to hear three, four different meditations on what Kol Nidre means to them and what we ought to be thinking about this year. We're also going to be having tonight and all of tomorrow meditations on the al the longer confession. And there's a lot to think about there. If you said Mincha, the, the afternoon service, we actually have already done one confession. And we're going to do it five more times tonight and tomorrow. And the wrong approach to that prayer is, I would never do that. Or I wonder in he, who in here has done that. Uh, luckily... There's far fewer of us, so that might be less difficult. You're not going to be walking home or walking to your car and say, can you believe what they were wearing? It's here because it's real. We've done these things. They wouldn't have been written if we didn't do them. So we need to take hold of this, think about these things, and how we're going to be just a little bit better next year. But first, let's really take some time to think about the Kol Nidre prayer. Why this service to open the holiest day of the year would begin with this legal action and this legal language. 
what is this formula compelling us towards? What, is it, what kind of person is it looking to create in us right now for the next 25 hours, but also for the rest of the year? So now we're going to hear from Brian Rosner and Nancy Jacobson on their thoughts on the Kol Nidre prayer. Lishana Tova. My name is Brian Rosner. My wife, Martha Roth, and I have been members of Rav Tzedek for almost 40 years now. This summer, Rabbi Minkus led a small group of Rofei members in Zoom discussions about Kol Nidre. We shared our personal experiences, discussed its origins and its interpretations, and its misinterpretations. Throughout these sessions, it was difficult for me to separate thinking about Kol Nidre from our experiences during the COVID pandemic. This pandemic has caused increased anxiety the pandemic has caused increased anxiety, fear, uncertainty, and unprecedented uncertainty, and unprecedented and sometimes insincere. We say things we don't mean in anger or haste or in love or fear. In the past, hearing the cantor chant Kol Nidre always was a familiar and comforting experience for me. As I experienced the Kol Nidre alongside my community, my friends, and my family in the sanctuary of our synagogue, I felt that the space where I heard and recited the Kol Nidre constructed a safe place in which to reflect deeply on our communal past and to celebrate the new year along with my personal hopes and intentions that I may be better and a more thoughtful person. In the synagogue, these intentions became a public affirmation. This year, we will recite Kol Nidre in the privacy of our homes, by ourselves, or with luck, with a few family members as witnesses. This change setting fundamentally changes how I and all of us will experience the process of Kol Nidre, and indeed the entire high holiday season. Whatever vows or promises we may make in the coming year as we navigate this crisis, I know that we can only do our best so that next year at Yom Kippur, we can be praying together, schmoozing in the lobby, and looking forward to the future. Whatever expectations we have for the Kol Nidre prayer, the prayer has the capacity to turn upside down. It's somber and mournful, the most solemn moment of the year for many Jews, yet it contains a joyous reprieve. Its language is legalistic, but it's a contract that explodes itself before it's sealed. Kol Nidre is an unconditional out clause for every kind of vow that Jews will make to ourselves or to God, not notably to other people, in the coming year. It asks that all our vows and promises be undone, repealed, canceled, voided, our vows shall not be considered vows, our renunciations shall not be considered renunciations, and our promises shall not be considered promises, period. It's strange to avoid the coming year's promises before we've even made them, and it doesn't fit the mood of introspection and repentance that we typically bring to Yom Kippur. The drafters of the Reform Moxor, the Gates of Prayer, this was troubling enough that they added a stipulation to it. In that version, the English following the Kol Nidre doesn't just say, our vows are canceled. It says, they will be null and void should we, after honest effort, find ourselves unable to fulfill them. And that seems like more like the thing, right? That we would do our best and ask that our vows be canceled only if we fail after trying really hard. But that's not what we have in our prayer book here in the traditional Kol Nidre. There's no good faith effort clause. It's an outright negation of what promises typically mean. Kol Nidre prayer recognizes in this most transactional, contractual sounding language that it uses, that our relationship with God and with ourselves is not purely transactional. There are lots of things that we're supposed to do and not do that have real consequences if we fail, but there's also some core relationship with God, with ourself, it can embrace and accept regardless of what was promised and what was done. A few years ago, I went to Kol Nidre services at Bevis Marks, the old Sephardic synagogue in London. 
And from the woman's balcony, I watched this pageantry, candlelit brass chandeliers and officiants with top hats. This was not my grandfather's Col Nidre, although it was someone's grandfather's Col Nidre. The next day, I talked about that service with some Ashkenazi British Jews, and one of them said, ah, yes, we're all about, forgive me, I have sinned. Make me a better person next year, God. But the Sephardim say, look, it's the nice judge who let us off last year, and they celebrate. Kol Nidre is somber as we face the things that we failed to do in the past and failed to do in the future. But it can be deeply joyous, too, as we celebrate that not everything depends on who we promise to be and what we vow to do. We are on page 204. We begin with Orzarua. Orzarua la tzadik uleishrelev simcha Orzarua la tzadik uleishrelev simcha Ozaruha la tzadik uleishrelev simcha Ozaruha la tzadik uleishrelev simcha Ozaruha la tzadik Uleishrelev simcha, or zaruha la tzadik. Uleishrelev simcha, or zaruha la tzadik. Uleishrelev simcha. Yeshiva shel mala Uveshiva shel mata Al dat hamakom ve al dat hakal Anu matirin leit palel Im havarianim Bishiva shel mala, uveshiva shel mata, al dat hamakom ve al dat hakal, anu matirin lehit palelim havarianim. Bishiva shel mala, uveshiva shel mata, al dat hamakom ve al dat hakal, anu matirin lehit palelim havarianim. Page two o five. Call me, Vachrame, Vechino ye, vechino se, usvot. De inen arna, udishtava. Ve 
Tehilin mvotalin lo sheririn velo kayamin nidrana lo nidre ve esarana la esare Ve 
la Ushvuhatana la shavuot. Continue on page two o five. 
Asher na satalam haze, mimitzraim vean hena, vesham nemar. Vayom meradonai, salachti kidvorecha, vayom meradonai, salachti kidvorecha, vayom meradonai, salachti kidvorecha. of page 207, and we rise. seven. Continue with the Havat Olam on the top of page 208. Havat Olam, Beit Yisrael, Am Chavta, Torah u'mitzvot, Chukim u'mishpatim, Otanu limadita. Al kein Adonai Eloheinu v'shochveinu v'kumeinu nasiach b'chukecha v'nismach b'divrei toratecha u'v'mitzvotecha le'olam v'ed Ki heim chayenu v'orech yameinu uvahem nege yomam v'alayla. Now 
Vea havat ra, altasir mi menule olamim, maru hatadonai. O hevamo Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kevon Malchuto, Mehavtaram <laughs> Vashivtecha bevetecha, uvelechtecha vaderech, uvishochpecha uvekumecha, ukshartam leot al yadecha, behayule totafot benenecha, uchetavtam al mizuzot betecha, uvisharecha. Page 209. Adonai Elohechem emet. Middle of page 210. O malchuto veratzon, kibelu alehem, Moshe umiriam, ubene Israel, lecha anushira, besimcha rabba. Yamaruchulam, mi kamoch abeli madonai, mi kamoch anedar ba kodesh, no ratihilot o sefele, malchutcha rauvanecha, bokei hayam lifnei Moshe, Zeilionu ve'ameru Adonaiim loch le'olam ha'ed V'nemar kifada Adonai t'yakov U'galo Miyad chazak mimenu Baruch ata Adonai Gal Israel. We turn to page 211 for the Hashkivenu prayer, and I just want to take a moment to call our attention to the the note, um, the meditation on the top of page 211 on the left side by Merle Feld, God's presence. What a stark contrast between the verses at the sea, where we were gathered together as a people, as a multitude, and saw the power of our warrior God. And then, the first verses of this prayer, where we are vulnerable and alone, looking to a more tender, personal side of the same God. Page 211. 
Hashkivenu, Adonai Eloheinu, Vishalom, Vishalom, Rehamidenu, Alkenu, Lechaim, Ufros, Aleinu, Sukkah, Now turn to page 212. In a moment, we'll say the Chatzik Kaddish, but first, Jonathan will recite the, the line that is proclaiming today is different than every other day, that today is Yom Kippur, the line that comes from the book of Leviticus. And then when Jonathan is finished with the Chatzik Kaddish on page 212, uh, 13, sorry, 213, we'll turn to the Amidah, which will run through page 221, and pay special attention. Uh, this is a unique Amidah. You'll be saying it many times over the course of the day, but we haven't said it in a year. So be uh, paying attention to all of the different things that have been added in to the normal Amidah. Page 212. <laughs> Litahen et chem, mikol chatoteichem, lifne Adonai titaru. Yir 
it gadol ve'it kadosh shemir aba amen me'al madi v'rachirute v'yamlik malchute b'chayechon u'v'yom echon u'v'chayei d'chol b'ch Yisrael ba'agalo v'zman kariv ve'imeru amen Yehei Shemei Rabbam Yivarach Le'alam ul'almei al'maya Yitparach Yitparach ve'yishtabach Ve'yitpar ve'yitrumam ve'yitnasei Ve'yitadar ve'yitaleh Ve'yitalal Shemei Dekudushah Brichu Le'ela, le'ela, mikol birchata v'shirata, tush mechata v'nechemata, tamiran be'alema v'imeru, amen.
cue sheet up here. We always have something from, from uh, the Gabais to tell us what's coming up, but this year we really need a cue sheet since there's so much going on, and now we get to that place on the cue sheet that makes those butterflies really start to flutter in my stomach, uh, where it says, Rabbi's Sermon. I have to say, before I begin, Rachel's always saying that I always ask a uh, how you doing? Like I'm Ed Cox or something. And I would do anything to be able to take a moment to look around the room and just say to you, how you doing? And I wish you can say it back to me. But I'm going to ask you to say something with me right now. Say this with me. I do not know. Thank you. If that is too difficult for you, just respond to me with, I'm not sure. sure. I wasn't counting on you guys, actually. This was kind of rhetorical to the camera um, because it's, I was going to say that's actually pretty pretty difficult to make a joke in a room that's empty, um, but God willing, next year in a room that's full. I do not know is something we are trained not to say. It goes against the uncertainty we are taught or innately pick up as inadequate. It is un-American not to boldly and assertively raise your hand, being sure of having the right answer. We see doubt as a place of darkness where a certainty is filled with light. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we know that's not true. I have for years been thinking through the powerful idea of negative capability. Negative capability is a fr- was a phrase coined by the poet John Keats, who came up with this resonant phrase to describe what sets Shakespeare apart from other writers. Keats felt that Shakespeare's distinct talent was his capability of being within uncertainties. Shakespeare wrote his characters free of judgment, comfortable with doubt filling in the dark spaces of their character, which gives us no choice but to embrace their imperfections and shortcomings. And this technique forces reader and audience alike to accept what we cannot know about them. And I think, more to the point, all of the imperfections and the unknown that live within us. I've thought about this for a long time, yet this idea is far from fully fleshed out. I'm bringing you what I have so far in the hope that we can figure it out together, that we together can get to version 2.0 of this sermon. And while I apologize for coming before you without a polished Kol Nidre sermon, I simply cannot see past this idea's trees as I stand in its forest. If we were together in person, and I was able to walk away from this lectern and call on you and hear your thoughts, and share those thoughts, and it be collaborative. I know that we could figure this idea out together, but since we're not physically together, and this is all I want to talk about and all I want to hear, we're going to give it a go, and I'm going to count on you for your comments, emails, and calls in the days and weeks to follow. Why do we feel uncertainty 
to be such a dramatic and destabilizing force? I don't have that answer, but I know that we all live with the illusion that we have it all figured out, that we have the idea nailed down, that we have our neighbor pegged, that we have the understanding that cuts through this or that political or social issue. If only they asked us, it would be resolved. You don't. And the sooner each of us can become comfortable with that truth, our lives, the communities we find ourselves in, and the country we live in will be bigger. We intuit this idea from our earliest age. When we are children, or even into adulthood, we think our parents have all the answers. Our first theological image is that of a parent. If we love our parents and had an enjoyable childhood, we look back to our parents from our childhood self with a sense of their all-knowing and all-powerful selves. Yet the moment you become a parent, the moment you carry that car seat beyond the threshold of the hospital gates, at that pregnant, liminal moment of transition from the, from the known past to the unknown future, you become acutely aware that your parents were just as clueless as you are. And this was true for Dr. Spock, Abraham and Sarah, and for Jonathan and Barbara. When we leave the nest for the first time and we enter school, we sit at our desks trying to solve the teacher's questions. Mr. or Miss so-and-so has the answer, and we are smart, we are right, and we are good if our work matches their answer. But when we become the teacher, we realize that to be a good teacher recognizes that there may not be a right answer. We may be one page ahead of our students in the textbook, and there are probably many who are one, two, or ten pages ahead of us. And the point of education arrives when we can reach that student and allow each student to teach us. As you sit listening to this sermon, the word is uncertainty, but in practice, it's humility. When we can walk through life embracing its uncertainties and the uncertainties we have about ourselves, we arrive at that place of humility, being humble before God, our teachers and our students, in shul and on the internet, in front of loved ones and in front of ourselves. That is the place of growth, of realizing what this day, Yom Kippur, is really after. This day is seeking a change. It is looking to affect us by figuring out how we can be better by using our past as our map. And the guideposts along the way require honesty, but also compassion. Years before Zoom was a thing, I embraced one of its technologies. For six years, the low-tech icon that followed me through the, wall, the halls of rabbinical school was that of the mute button. I quickly became unsure of myself for the first time in my life, my hand never getting above my shoulder. All through my schooling, I had thought I was smart, but in the heady, intellectually elite-dominated atmosphere of rabbinical school, I became unsure. It took a lot of time before I began to realize that my classmates, while very smart and full of heart, did not have all the answers. Yet this created a dissonance in my burgeoning adulthood and rabbinic education of what I was being taught and what I was taking in. Our institution seemed to reward certitude, a confidence in that first hand to shoot up, to embrace the person with the best story at the campfire. All the while, the Talmudic text that we were studying did not. The experience of studying Talmud is to be guided through the tricky dance of doubt. The Talmud choreographs the steps of uncertainty. The anonymous narrator walks you through an issue. We hear from Rabbi A and Rabbi B. We study and study those lines. We master the issue knowing it by heart. And then we hear from Rabbi X, who speaks in the name of Rabbi A, and Rabbi Y in the name of Rabbi B. And what we were sure of, what we thought might be the destination of the arguments or the legal decision, ends up being the opposite. And this is often only the beginning 
of what turns out to be a discussion that ends in a place we would have never thought or considered when we first had the issue mastered. This whole process is maddening, but only till you realize that the Talmud is not interested in the certainty you are seeking out of it. It is looking to teach you how to be nimble, more present for the confounding issues that life will always present us with. The Talmud leads us through a position of feeling certain that this animal is kosher or that we must pay our neighbor for our ox goring their ox. Then it is all undone. Shade and doubt thrown on the whole series of arguments. The Talmud is thumbing its nose at mastery, that there will always be a limit to what we can know about ourselves, each other, and about life. Of course, we do need to know if that chicken we just bought at the market is kosher, or if we owe our neighbor restitution. But those are the small questions of life. We have Google, and I am sure they had an expedient way of getting to the answer, too. The Talmud's end result may be that the answer remains opaque, but we are better left to live in a world that is not black and white more comfortable living with our neighbor and the person in the mirror who are neither fully good nor fully bad. The Jewish project of the rabbis was telling us to resist uncertainty and persist through spaces of sureness. Reject the true believers, those who know that they are right. Then we will be able to pause before we cast aspersions to linger over that email for one more day, to listen rather than talking, to sit back rather than sprinting forward. And then, maybe, you can end the years of not speaking because maybe you might have been the one who was wrong. And then, hopefully, you can forgive yourself. In the small and concealed spaces between the words of those meandering rabbinic discussions, we find the ability to assume the best of someone else's intentions and seek out our better angels. Judaism resists the easy answer, the quick fix, the easy tweet, and the knee-jerk reaction. And we should all embrace that yearning, if only here, to be as pious in this mitzvah as we possibly can. Yom Kippur is commanding, is commanding us that we switch from the default mode that we operate in to toggle from smallness to generosity, from resisting judgment to embracing compassion, to take hold of our current selves and find meaning in the embarrassment and the pain of our younger selves. How could I have thought that? I assumed the worst. And I'm ashamed I was so strident. I was zealous for unrighteous causes. I leaned towards rebuke rather than empathy. When we're being honest with ourselves and we look back on our past, we all should be striking our chest for those. I have a hard time thinking about my younger self. It feels like a slow motion cringe reel. But what if, what if that is in no small part what Yom Kippur is training us to do? And what if that was actually the true ritual of today? We are being thrust towards discomfort, but rather than recoiling from the younger version of ourselves, whether that was yesterday or 10 years ago, and as an aside, it is both, that we embrace that person. That is where we learn, and that is where we will grow. Yom Kippur is asking that we live within the memory and reality of each version of ourselves, but not for a moment in time, and not only for 25 hours, but every day. The Torah simply says about today that we must afflict ourselves, and figuring out what that means is our sacred duty. And I'm pretty sure that it's not fasting and wearing rubber shoes. It is not to ha say, have an easy fast, and arrive at dinner tomorrow night having made it. The point is to begin the long, never-ending road towards being better. Embracing the ritual, the religious technology of uncertainty and doubt. 
We fast today to leave the comfort of everyday life, to put aside the things we mistakenly attribute our dignity towards for the purpose of getting back to the person that is unmasked, unwilling to be muted, but who can humbly say, I do not know. This is certainly a sermon inspired by the moment, a time that demands the calming force of humility all the while we are being accosted and flooded by people who think they have the answer. It is a time of great focus on statues and public figures, what makes them important and what makes them problematic, what makes them a part of us whether or not they are standing or have been toppled. It is certainly about our ability to reckon with those we care about, those people we know or the figures we have looked to for guidance whose reputation or legacy has been tarnished rightly or wrongly. Embracing uncertainty, looking to negative capability will help us fill our tool belts and allow us to best access what is right and wrong and for whom. Yet these ideas, just like finding out if that chicken was kosher or not, are the small issues that fill in the sea that we have been thrown into. We have strong opinions because we falsely assume that having a strong opinion will keep us afloat while drowning those we disagree with. But the larger issue, the real one, is what will get us back to Yom Kippur? How do we arrive at the awareness of the day of affliction tomorrow and the next day and the day after that? when we are no longer fasting, but must find and use the tools to help us swim ashore. That is what I do not know, and that is what we must figure out. The Torah, by asking us to afflict our souls, we are supposed to come out the other end bigger, having grown. The afflicting we are doing is a test. Do we have the resolve the emotional and spiritual wherewithal to embrace that test? Or do we complain about being hungry? Do we have the courage to pass the test, clearing out the debris of everyday life so that we will no longer be our own stumbling blocks? We are all imperfect. The afflicting of Yom Kippur is asking us to sharpen our ability to reach for and ultimately embrace those imperfections rather than hiding from them. This year, let us embrace our multitudes. Embrace being the teacher who does not have all the answers and the student with the courage to mute and unmute. Strive to be the person with the confidence to raise your hand and the courage not to speak. Walk boldly towards the fact that two truths need not be mutually exclusive. Embrace being the child that recognizes our parents not knowing and then sees beyond it. Learn to lean forward and embrace the person in the mirror who has fell short, yet decides to keep going. Learn to live by the idea that we are all made in the divine image, yet creation is not whole, is not complete, and has never been perfect, just like each of us. I want to wish you all a happy and a healthy new year. And may we all be sealed into the book of life for a year of meaning, purpose, and blessings. Shana tova, gemar tova. We return to our Machsors on page 223. This is the Piyut Ya'ale. Ya'ale Ya'ale Ta'ch 
חנוננו מערב. ויבואו שבתנו מבוקר, וירעינוננו עד ערב. צדקתנו מבוקר ויירא פדיוננו עד ערב. יעלה, יעלה, עינוינו מערב ויבוא, ויבוא. סליחתנו מבוקר, וירא נקתנו עד ערב, וירא, וירא נקתנו עד ערב. יעלה מנוסינו מערב. ויבוא למנו בבוקר וירא, וירא, כיפורנו, כיפורנו, וירא, וירא, כיפורנו, כיפורנו. וירא כיפורנו עד ערב. יעלה, יעלה, אישנו מערב, ויבוא, ויבוא, טוהרנו מבוקר, וירא חינוננו עד ערב. וירא, וירא, חינוננו עד ערב. יעלה זיכרוננו מערב, ויבוא ויהודנו מבוקר, וירא, וירא. הדרתנו, הדרתנו, וירא, וירא, הדרתנו, הדרתנו, וירא, הדרתנו, אנא ערב. יאללה דופקנו מערב. ויבוא גילנו מבוקר וירא, וירא, בקשתנו, בקשתנו, וירא, וירא, בקשתנו, בקשתנו. וירא בקשתנו עד ערב. יעלה, יעלה, אין כתנו מערב. ויבוא, ויבוא, אליך מבוקר, ויירא אלינו עד ערב. וירא, וירא, אלינו עד ערב. If you turn to page 224, the next prayer, as part of the Slichot liturgy, 
uh, it starts on the fourth line of 224 and continues for the next four lines, and then it jumps to page 225 to the top, Hanishamach, Hanishamalach, Behaguf Poalach. So we begin Lechuna Ranana, Melody by Yours Truly, fourth line of page 224. Lehudinanina la donai Naria Naria Litsuri Shainu Nikad Mafanav Betona Pismirot Pismirot Naria Lo Ashello Hayam Belhu Asau Yabeshet Yadav Yadaviat Saru Asher Biado Nefesh Kolchai Veru Ach veru ach kol me sarish lechuner an nal adonai nariya nariya letzur yeshenu nikad mafanav betona pizmirot pizmirot nariya lo Hanishamalach ve'aguf polach Chusa ala malach Hanishamalach ve'aguf polach Chusa ala malach Hanishamalach ve'aguf shelach Adonai ase liman shemecha Atanu atanu al shimcha Adonai ase liman shemecha Ba'avur kevod shimcha Ba'avur kevod shimcha Ki yeil chanun verachum shemecha Lema'an shimcha Adonai v'salach talavoneinu ki ravhu. We now turn to page 227 for this wonderful poem, Ki Hine Kachomer, where the imagery walks us through different craftspeople who shape the material and so are we in your hand, healer of wounds, righteous God, partner of sin and transgression. And please join in the refrain, La Brit Habet, at the end of each verse. We'll do four verses. Ki hine kachomer Biyad hayotzer Birtsoto marchiv Ubirtsoto mikatzer Keinanachnu biyadecha Chesed notzer La brit habet Ve'al te'fen, ve'al te'fen, ve'al te'fen la'yetzer. Ki hinei ka'even be'yad ha'msateit birtsoto o'chez Uvirtsoto mechateit Kein anachnu beyadecha Mechaye umemoteit La brit habet Ve'al te'fen Ve'al te'fen Ve'al te'fen la'yetzer Ki hinei Kagarzen Be'yadecha rash Birtsoto Di 
Liebeck Laur, u wird so toperasch. Keine Nacht nur bejadecha, to mechani varasch. La Brita Beit, we all tefen, we all tefen, we all tefen la yetzer. Final verse on page 227. Kine kakesef beyan hatzoreif. Bir zoto mi sag seg, u bir zoto mi zaref, keina nach nu beyadecha, mam zil mazor teref, la brit abet, ve al tefen, ve al tefen, ve al tefen, la yetzer. Continue at the top of page 232 with El Melech Yoshev. El Melech Yoshev al Kiserachamim. Mit naheba chasidut, mochei lavonot amo. Ma'avi rishon, rishon, marbe mechila lechataim. Uslicha lafoshim. Hotzetzer akot im kol basar varuach, locher atam tigmol. El horrei talanu lo mashelo shesrei, huzachor lanu hayom berit shelo shesrei, Kehodata le anav mi kerem, ke mo she katuv. Vayered Adonai me anan, vayit yatsei vi mo sham. Vayikra b'shem Adonai. Adonai, Adonai, Erachum v'chanun, Erachum v'chanun, Erech ha'paim, Verav chesed v'emet, Notzer chesed l'alafim, Notzer chesed l'alafim, Nosei avon v'afesha v'chata v'nake. Selach lanu avinu, ki chatanu, mechalanu malkeinu, ki fashanu, ki ata Adonai tov v'salach, verav chesed lechol korecha. I would like us to read responsively at the bottom of page 232, 
please reply in italics. Listen to our prayers, God. Hear our pleading, our sorrow-filled voices. May your ear hear and your eyes open to the prayers of your servants, the people Israel. In your, in your heavenly abode, may you hear their pleas and prayers and respond to what they ask. May you forgive your people who have sinned against you. As a parent look kindly on a child, may you, God, look kindly on us. Salvation is Adonai's alone. Pour blessings on your people forever. Adonai Tzvaot is with us, our support, the God of Jacob forever. Blessed is the one who trusts in you, Adonai Tzvaot. Adonai, save us. Surely the Sovereign One will respond to us on the day we call out. Altogether, as befits your abundant love, please forgive this people's sin, just as you have always forgiven this people from the time of the exodus from Egypt until now. When Moses recited this prayer, it is recorded, Adonai said, I forgive as you asked. Vayomer Adonai salach di kidvarecha. We continue on the second paragraph of page 233. The choir joins us for Shema Kolenu. The ark opens, please rise. Shema, Shema, Shema.
service, the prayers of forgiveness, and turn to the vidui, the, con the confessional service. Eloheinu, velohe avoteinu, vui imoteinu, selach lanu, mechalanu, kap Pelanu, ki anu amecha ve ata Eloheinu, anu vanecha ve ata vinu, anu avadecha le ata adoneinu, anu ke halecha ve ata helkeinu. Anu nachale chave ata goralenu, anu tsone chave ata roenu, anu chame chave ata notrenu, anu fulate chave ata yotrenu, anu rayate chave ata dodenu, Anu skula te chave ata kroveinu, anu amecha ve ata malkeinu, anu mamirecha ve ata mamireinu. Anu azefanim ve ata rachum ve chanun, anu kishe oref ve ata erech apayim, Anu mle avon ve ata male rachamim, anu yamenu kutsein lo ver, ve ata hush no techa lo yitamu. Eloheinu ve lohe avoteinu ve imoteinu, tavo lefanecha tefilateinu, ve al titalam mitchinateinu, she eina nachtu azeifanim ukshe oref, לא מה לפניך אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו ואמותינו צדיקים אנחנו ולא חטאנו אבל אנחנו ואבותינו ואמותינו חטאנו. אשמנו 
pagadnu kazanu di barnu dofi a Shanu, Zadnu, Hamasnu, Tafanu Sheker, Ah, 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 Yatsnu Ra, Kizavnu, Latsnu, Maranu, Niatsnu, Saranu, Avinu, Pashanu, Sararnu. Kishinu Orev Rashanu Shihatnu Tiavnu Tainu Titanu We read together in the English second paragraph of page 235. We have turned from your goodly laws and commandments, but it has not profited us. Surely you are in the right with respect to all that comes upon us, for you have acted faithfully, but we have been in the wrong. In a moment, we will turn to the Alchet, the, the longer confession that we will say together many times over the course of the next day. And as always, I ask you to, to focus on a few of them, not on every single one of them, but focus on a few that really stick out at you. There was a group that studied with me. We looked at the, the Alchet over the course of the summer, and then there was another group who we looked simply at the idea of apologies and forgiveness, what makes it hard to apologize and what makes it difficult to to hear that apology. So now we're going to hear a couple of videos um, that deal with exa just exa ju exactly that, um, priming us for this longer confession, the Alchet, that we're going to hear from Lior Shahilovitz and Eva Basa. But I didn't even do half of the things in the Alchet. I haven't taken any bribes. Forbidden trysts? <laughs> yeah, right. Not ever, and certainly not during a pandemic. Yet, I'm supposed to confess to these misdeeds anyway? And then, after falsely confessing, I'm supposed to confess to the sin of empty confession? It's no wonder Franz Kafka was a Jew. Many of you likely have the same reaction. Yet, there must be some explanation for the persistence of the Alchet in our liturgy since at least the ninth century. As a scholar of privacy law, I was immediately struck by the contrast between the Alchet and Roman Catholic confession, which occurs in a darkened cabinet. It turns out the confession in the Catholic church was originally done in public, but by the 12th century, the church began its shift toward private individual confessions of sin in part to deal with the problem of parishioner eavesdropping. Compared to the privacy-preserving Catholic approach, public confession in front of families and neighbors seems humiliating in a way that will undermine introspection and candor. But there's an ingeniousness built into the Alchet. We are each directed to confess our sins out loud, even though we haven't committed many of them. The confessor knows which statements are true, but everyone else remains in the dark. The overbroad Alchet promotes conscience clearing in public by introducing statistical noise. The best cinematic portrayal of this phenomenon occurs in the 1960 Kirk Douglas classic, Spartacus. In the movie's climax, the Romans have captured Spartacus and dozens of his fellow rebels. The Romans pledged to spare the lives of all the rebels so long as the rebels identify Spartacus, their leader, who is to be crucified. Kirk Douglas's Spartacus rises to his feet, and just as he's about to announce his, his identity, his friend Antonius yells out, I'm Spartacus, 
And then another rebel yells, I'm Spartacus. And before long, the entire group of rebels are screaming, I'm Spartacus, at the top of their lungs, while Kirk Douglas's Spartacus looks on in stunned silence. Kirk Douglas died earlier this year at the age of 103. And in a storied movie career, the scene he's best known for is one in which he says not a word. The al lets us each broadcast what needs to be said all at once. Upon reflection, communal confession seems to make a lot more sense than having us take turns confessing our sins individually to Rabbi David so that he can grant us absolution. But the lesson of Spartacus is that if you search your memories and cannot recall an instance this year of scorning parents and teachers or of defrauding others, reciting those confessions out loud remains a sincere act. It's a true and empathic expression of solidarity that lets us all be imperfect in a dignified way. Why can it be hard to apologize and or forgive? This question comes up a lot around the time of the high holidays because a lot of us want to start the new year with clean slates and leave disagreements in the past. But sometimes it can be hard to sincerely apologize. Often we can find ourselves apologizing for the wrong reasons, like wanting to move on and forget about it. Or we may not actually feel sorry, but want others to think that we are. Today I'm going to discuss my thoughts on performative apologies and how we can be more sincere when we offer remorse. A performative apology is when somebody says that they're sorry and they don't actually mean it. They just want to save face and make other people believe that they truly regret their actions. Social media has become an outlet for politicians, celebrities, and regular people to share their lives, opinions, anything else to the public. When someone does something wrong, it can often be spread around to other people quickly online, and suddenly everyone is demanding an apology. So, the only way for this person to move on and regain their previous fan base and adoration is by apologizing. Do they feel bad about what they did? Or are they choosing to just get past it as soon as they can? Often it's the latter. While this may be the easier choice, I personally think that it is better to take a moment to figure out what you did wrong and who you hurt. From that point, you can determine how to right that wrong by maybe talking with those people, see what they're feeling, and then you can offer a more sincere apology. It could take longer to get their understanding and forgiveness, but it is also a more honest way to be a better person. And I think that during Yom Kippur and around the high holidays, we need to find a way to be better people and more open-minded and accepting. Thank you. Thank you, Lior and Eva. We turn to the al and we will read it together in English. We read it responsibly. We have sinned against you unwillingly and willingly. And we have sinned against you through hardening our hearts. We have sinned against you thoughtlessly. And we have sinned against you in idle chatter. We have sinned against you through sexual immorality. And we have sinned against you openly and in private. We have sinned against you knowingly and deceitfully. And we have sinned against you by the way we talk. We have sinned against you by defrauding others. And we have sinned against you in our innermost thoughts. We have sinned against you through forbidden tryst. And we have sinned against you through empty confession. We have, skinned against, we have sinned against you by scorning parents and teachers. And we have sinned against you purposely and by mistake. We have sinned against you by resorting to violence. And we have sinned against you by public desecration of your name. We have sinned against you through foul speech. And we have sinned against you through foolish talk. We have sinned against you through pursuing the impulse to evil. And we have sinned against you wittingly and unwittingly. <laughs> Selach lanu mechalanu kapelanu 
ויעל כולם אלוהס ליחוד סלח לנו מחלנו סלח לנו מחלנו כפלנו against you through denial and deceit. And we have sinned against you by taking bribes. We have sinned against you by clever cynicism. And we have sinned against you by speaking ill of others. We have sinned against you by the way we do business. And we have sinned against you in our eating and drinking. We have sinned against you by greed and oppressive interest. And we have sinned against you through arrogance. We have sinned against you in everyday conversation. And we have sinned against you through conspiratorial glances. We have sinned against you through condescension. And we have sinned against you through stubbornness. We have sinned against you by throwing off all restraint. And we have sinned against you by rashly judging others. We have sinned against you by plotting against others. And we have sinned against you through selfishness. We have sinned against you through superficiality. And we have sinned against you through stubbornness. We have sinned against you by rushing to do evil. And we have sinned against you through gossip. We have sinned against you through empty promises. And we have sinned against you through baseless hatred. We have sinned against you by betraying trust. And we have sinned against you by succumbing to confusion. Jonathan, if you could uh, just wait a second. I want to linger on this page just for just a moment more. If you're a rabbi, maybe if you're a cantor, or maybe if you're just kind of a, a public Jew wearing a kippah or something else that makes it clear that you're Jewish, you often find yourself having conversations with people who will say, I'm a bad Jew. And of course, what they mean is they don't observe rituals and observances in the same way that they assume that I do. But if you take a moment to look through all of these sins, the things that we just read through, I'd like you to find where it says, we have sinned against you by not observing Shabbat. We have sinned against you by not keeping kosher. We have sinned against you by not making it to morning minion. That one should be in here, though. These are the sins between us, between each other. And of course, if we're going to believe in God, we want to think that the sins between us hurt God. But defrauding others, false speech, being condescending, these are everyday things. And we don't have conversations about the author 
of, of the Machzor, of our prayer book, in the same way that we do about the Torah or in some communities, that's a very active conversation. Is this written by God or was this written by humans? We know this was written by humans. I mean, we might know who wrote the Torah also, but we'll pretend not to sometimes. Next time you have that urge to say, I'm a, not a good Jew or a lesser Jew. First of all, don't. Don't think that. But come back to this, to the al this thing that I would imagine the vast majority of Jews are all around the world are all saying right now, the good and the bad ones. And I think what this prayer is saying is God is not judging who is a good or bad Jew in the same way that we might be. We continue at the bottom of page 242 with this beautiful, short, direct prayer, Rachamana De'ane. This is very simple nusach for this very beautiful, short prayer. Rachamana De'ane Le'aniye Anena Rachamana yane lmaki khirukha anena Rachamana yane litfire lima anena Rachamana anena We've inched a little bit closer towards those gates closing, and before we get any any further, we're going to turn back to the idea of Kol Nidre, and we're going to hear two more thoughts on the Kol Nidre prayer from Anna Siegler and Sherry Gutman. For me, the Kol Nidre prayer is like a fulcrum point. Let me explain. The fulcrum point is the point on a scale that determines when the weights on each side of the scale are perfectly balanced. The moment when we chant the Kol Nidre prayer represents a point of balance in time. Balance between last year and the coming year. Balance between what was and what will be. In this sense, the prayer brings us to a place of calm and an opportunity to let go of our sins of the past year and to forgive ourselves for those sins. In a modern reading of the prayer, we look to the future and we express our gratitude that we will be forgiven for whatever sins we may commit in the coming year. This moment, the fulcrum point in time, allows us to experience God's mercy and to find inner calm. Let's consider three commentaries on the qualities of mercy. First, Shakespeare. In Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Portia speaks of the attributes of God in terms of mercy. In her courtroom speech, Portia is seeking forgiveness for Antonio, and she asks Shylock to be merciful rather than to exact his punishment for Antonio's broken promise. Here is what Portia says about mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. And a few lines later on, Portia continues. Mercy is an attribute to God himself. 
and earthly power is most like God's when mercy seasons justice. Then, building on this, Shakespeare, through Portia, emphasizes the need to temper justice with mercy for ourselves and for others. Though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. In other words, Shakespeare points out that if perfect justice were to be realized, none of us would be forgiven. No one is perfect. We all need mercy. To offer another example, our granddaughter Mira, at nine years of age, arrived at a similar understanding of forgiveness when she and her classmates at the Jewish Enrichment Center were discussing the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent. Mira was bothered by the fact that God gives Adam, Eve, and the serpent lifelong punishments and doesn't leave room for them to change. And drawing on one final authority on forgiveness and mercy, consider the words of Brian Stevenson, a brilliant criminal defense lawyer and author of the book, Just Mercy. He says, quote, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. This bears repeating. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. When we weigh ourselves in the balance between right and wrong, no one of us is blameless, and each of us deserves mercy. The Kol Nidre prayer offers us that moment in time, that moment of balance at the fulcrum point, when we accept ourselves as we are, forgive ourselves and others, and experience the blessing of mercy. Lashana Tova. Our Moxfish translation of the Kol Nidre prayer says that the repudiation of promises that we make for the coming year has only to do with those promises that we make to ourselves or to God. It does not get us off the hook for the commitments that we make to each other, to families, our friends, our community. So we are tasked with making amends to our fellow human beings during the period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to have a clean slate as we approach Yom Kippur. And it is implied that we will be making promises to be a better person in the coming year. But this year, I'm not as sure what my sins have been and what would constitute making an amend, or even if I actually can make a meaningful amend or promise to some of my fellow human beings. Never before have I come to this period of contemplation of what it means to be a good person filled with so much anxiety, anger, fear, and feelings of helplessness. The world seems to be fraying at the edges, if not seriously unraveling. In truth, neither me nor mine have suffered direct injury as a result of the tragic events erupting with overwhelming frequency in our world. But there are many in my personal world who suffer or have suffered from the hate and violence that has and continues to exist. And what I mean by that, have suffered directly. As a Jew, I'm committed to tikkun olam, to repair the world. So what to do? what to promise, what to commit to. I don't know the answers to those questions yet, but this is what I contemplate as I come to this season. These are my thoughts as I approach the days of awe, knowing that God holds me to a higher standard for delivering on my promises to my fellow beings than he does in delivering in my promises to myself and to him. We rise as the ark is opened, and the choir will lead us in Avinu Malkenu on page 243. Avinu Malkenu, Shama Koleinu, Avinu Malkenu, Chatanu Lefanecha. Avinu malkeinu, chamal aleinu, v'alo 
Aleinu, Vatapenu. Avinu Malkenu, Continue on the top of page 244 with the traditional Avinu, Mal Avinu Malkenu melody, third line of the page. Avinu Malkenu, Honeinu Vanenu. Avinu Malkenu, Honeinu Vanenu, Ki ein banu masi. Aseimanu, sedaka vachesed. Aseimanu, sedaka vachesed. Vehoshienu, avinu makenu, choneinu vane. Kenu chonenu vanenu kien banu masim. Lots of harmony at home. Asei manu sedaka vachesed. Asei manu sedaka vachesed vehoshiyeh. As the ark is closed, we turn to the middle of page 245 for the Kaddish Shalem, and we are joined once more by the choir. Yit kadal ve yit kadash meraba amen ve yalema tivrach yirute ve yamlich malchute ve chayichol ve yomechol ve chayedechol ve yisrael ha agala u bizman kari u bizman kari ve yimaru ve yimaru ve yimaru Amen. Shame <laughs> Amen. 
Tid kabels lade hon var han med hon i sig. Kan du få han de vissmänga bimero? Bimero. 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 Israel, Turn to page 246 for the Alenu. Alenu le shabe achladon hakol atet kudlal yotze breishit shelo asanu ki goye haratod velo samanu ki mishpachod hadama shelo sam chelkenu kahem vengor alenu kechol hamonam. Vanachnu korim, umishtachavim umodim, lifne melech malche hamlachim, hakadosh baruchu. Ki hamalkut shel chayi uleol meatim loch bekavod kagatu betoratecha adonaim loch leolam vaed venema vehaya adonai lemelech al kol haaretz bayom hahu bayom hahu iye adonai. Ushemo, 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 Echad. You may be seated. Today, on the 10th of Tishrei, we remember Pearl Chesler, Abbott Coburn, Rose Fetman, Berta Khan, Janet Raker, Morris Robin, Bela Rosen, Ida Silverman, and Lewis Wolf. And we continue to remember Reinhold Achinger and Devorah Budnick. May their memory continue to impact our lives. All those observing a yard site are saying Kaddish. The mourner's Kaddish is on page 247. Yikadal v'yikadash shimei rabah v'amora divra chirute v'amich machute v'chayichon u'vimechon u'v'chay dechol beit Yisrael Bagua Uzman Kari Vimru Amen. Yehesh me Raba Mevarach Leolam Omeo Maya. Yiparach vi Shabach vi Baar vi Baran vi Nase. Vi Dadar vi Dale vi Dalal Shme de Kucha Brihu. Leela Leela Minkobirchata Vishirata. Tushbechata Venechamata Damiran Bamala Vimru Amen. Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shemaya. Vechaim Alenu Val Koyasrael Vimru Amen. Ose shalom b'mermav, hu ya'ase shalom. Aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Shana tova, everybody. Shana tova. Yashir koach to, to Jonathan and to Rachel. Uh, the way you harmonized was absolutely spectacular. It was really a highlight for me tonight. Jonathan, as always, you brought it. And um, I love that l'chun aranana. And I was, I was wondering how it was going to work out without the choir behind you, uh, but you got it. You did it, and it was great. Rachel, it's always wonderful to be standing up here with you, and I like, uh, I like the additional stender over there. 
Um, Jeremy and Liana, excellent job. Your first Yom Kippur. It's as if you've been doing this for a week already. So thank you very much. Tomorrow we will begin with Shachrit at 9.15. And the day will flow from there. Just um, a few extra notes. Um, the Family Corner Zoom Room will be open at 9 a.m. Minyan Katan will be at 9.30. Minyan Gadol with Rachel will be at 10 a.m. Um, and then later on, um, Jonathan Posner will be leading a teen study. And Dan Liebenson, despite what the time says on your ticket, will be leading a a Torah study immediately after Yisker, um, at around the time of Musaf beginning. And there will be a few other curveballs in terms of timing, but we'll save that for tomorrow. I hope everyone has um, a good rest of their evening, a meaningful fast, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us. We turn now to page... 248 for Psalm 27, the psalm for the season. And then we will conclude with Yigdal. Lulehe manti lira ot betu baranai be eretz chayim. Kave laranai, chazak via metli becha, me kave el adonai. Yigdal is on 250, thank you. Yigdal Elohim chai ve yishtabach. Nim tsavene tel mitziuto Echad ve'en yachid k'yichudo Nelam ve'gam en sof le'achduto Ne'lo demut haguf ve'en oguf Lo na'aroch elav kedushato Kadmo lecho davar Hashem nivra Rishon ve'en reshit l'reshito Hino adon olam lecho notzar Yore gedulato malchuto Shefa nevuato netano Elan sheskulato vetifarto Lo kam be Yisrael kemo sheod Navi umabid et temunato Torah demet natan le'amoel al yad neviyo neman beto lo ya chalifa el velo ya mir dato le'olamin lezulato. So fair, you may sit on a new mabit less of Tava Becan Mato Gomel Leish said, Kemi follow, no ten let us shara Kedi Shato. Yishlach leket yamin meshicheinu Liftot mechakeket yeshuato Metim yechayel berov chasto Baruch adeyat shem teilato Metim yechayel Merov chasto, baruch ha
Dayan, Shem Tehilato. Shana Tova, Gmar Hatima Tova. Yasher Koch. Yasher Koch.
beach.